Um, next, we're going to jump over to our start our session two, which is a bit of a more technical discussion about kind of the, the properties of the fuel and how it works. And one of the people I'd like to introduce called to the stage is our friend Alan Schaefer. Alan is the head of the Diesel Technology Forum. Thanks very much, Dane. Great to be with everybody this afternoon. But I'm with uh, the Diesel Technology Forum. We're based in Washington, D.C., which is uh, a popular or unpopular place, depending on your perspective these days. Um, I'm happy to say we're outside the Beltway, so um, we have a, uh, a very objective view of the world and, uh, and how we fit into it. And that's what I'd like to share with you, uh, with you today. So I'm going to uh, give you a quick look at where diesel is today from a broad technology perspective, and then really ask a question about how does diesel fit into the future? because that's really what, uh, what it's all about. Uh, first, I'm uh, happy to, to recognize uh, our members who are the leaders in clean diesel technology, and I am very proud to call Neste one, uh, one of our members. So thank you very much for your support, and uh, you can learn more about us uh, and visit our website. Um, but what I'd like to start out with is a very basic, um, high-level kind of question, and that is really why are we still talking about diesel today? This is a 123-year-old technology. Well, the reason we're still talking about it today is because it works, right? It has a unique combination of features, um, including the fact that it is the most energy-efficient internal combustion engine, proven, available, durable, reliable. Um, and the last two points uh, on this slide are really the keys for the future. That is, it is clean and it is renewable. Um, Diesel is a key part of our global economy. Um, it is a, the prime mover in 15 sectors of the, the U.S. economy. And if you had to look at that on an equivalency basis, um, it's as big as the entire utility sector or as big as the information technology sector. That's what diesel contributes to the U.S. Uh, US economy. And you all are familiar with where it is. You've already told us about some of the vehicles and generators and other things that use the technology. But um, the significance of where diesel is really just cannot be understated. Um, uh, and really, the opportunity to make diesel a good thing better um, also evolves from that same thinking, that if it's so pervasive in our world, um, how can we make this technology even better than it is today? Over the last decade, 15 years uh, or so, um, the industry has been fundamentally transforming this technology. And we now have a very, uh, a very new chapter in the history of diesel engines of all kinds. And that was the advent of the clean diesel system. So uh, in 2004 in California, step one of that happened, which was the introduction of ultra-low sulfur diesel. And then following that, you're all aware of the emission standards that came in that basically took diesel engine particulate and NOx emissions down to near zero levels. That's the clean diesel system that we talk about today. Includes things like advanced emissions controls as well, selective catalytic reduction and, and diesel particulate filters. Um, you've all heard about that and you're uh, familiar with those technologies. Um, and if you look at it across the board, and this is a chart that shows everything from backhoes and farm tractors to locomotives, highway trucks, you can see where we're going uh, and where we are today, and that is very near zero. And uh, the most important question, though, is where are we going for the future? Um, but many of the, the concerns that we hear about diesel today come from the technology of yesterday, the older technology. So when you hear about folks uh, talking about health studies on diesel and um, its impact in terms of visible smoke and those sort of things, those are technologies that are uh, over 10 years old, and, and in many cases, even older than that. Um, so our focus um, as an industry is on new technology diesel engines and what they mean and how they fit into the future. I'll explore just three areas, passenger vehicles, heavy duty on-road, and then the off-road technology. So how many people in this room are driving a diesel vehicle today? Okay, we need to see more hands than that. Um, and uh, many of you know that uh, diesel has been in the news over the last year or so, and not for great reasons, thanks to uh, uh, Volkswagen and their uh, corporate decision to uh, violate some emission standards. 
And we're not, uh, as an organization, we're not here to explain that or to apologize for it. Um, that is not the clean diesel technology that we know and talk about. Um, so let me put that right on the table. Um, but what has that situation done for us? And certainly it has a lot of people talking about diesel. And uh, what also people are talking about, and companies like uh, those on this slide, is about the importance, uh, continued importance of diesel in the passenger vehicle segment. The manufacturers have spoken out about their commitment to diesel technology, and not just spoken out, but they've uh, announced new products into the marketplace. And the reason that diesel technology in cars, pickup trucks, and other um, light duty vehicles is so important is because of the fuel efficiency and CO2 benefits that come from using it. Um, so we looked at what the cars and light trucks <clears throat> and heavy duty pickup trucks on the road from 2005 through 2015, what did that mean in terms of environmental impact? And we found out that just those vehicles on the road had a tremendous impact on fuel savings, reduced about 70 million tons of CO2, uh, saved over 261 million barrels of crude oil, as if those vehicles uh, compared to if they were running on gasoline. So the diesel option um, reduces CO2 and saves fuel. And if you're wondering about whether or not manufacturers are still interested in diesel, um, earlier this year in January, Ford Motor Company at the Detroit Auto Show announced that uh, in their 2018 F-150, the most popular selling vehicle um, in America for the last 40 years, that truck will have a diesel engine option for 2018. So let's think about that for just a second, what that signifies about a commitment to a technology in this market. It is very significant. And we also had an announcement by Chevrolet about the Chevy Cruze diesel. EPA highway rated at 52 miles per gallon, making it the most fuel efficient non-hybrid vehicle available today. So those are some good examples about why diesel is going to be around uh, for a good while in the passenger vehicle segment. If we turn to heavy duty trucks, this is really the place where a lot of policy um, and discussion happens here in California and other places. And many uh, regulations have been passed in recent years, not just on emission standards, but more recently on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And you've probably heard about these at some level, but <clears throat> they basically require uh, truck and engine manufacturers to produce vehicles in the future that get better fuel economy. You know, and fuel economy today is what, six, seven miles a gallon or so. Um, we can easily envision of the average of all trucks on the road today. New trucks you can see uh, up in the uh, upper nine, 10 miles a gallon um, in the newest technology vehicles with selective catalytic reduction. So the fuel efficiency gains are significant. And going forward, uh, there's also some discussion about future changes in emission standards and, and all of that. And uh, that's based here in California as well. Um, I would like to say, though, in the course of all these regulations pointing towards the future, and I'm talking about the 2027 timeframe, EPA and California all base this on the diesel technology. It's not based on switching fuels to natural gas. It's not based on other things. It's based on the diesel engine and what it can do. Um, and if you're interested about what it has done already in California, consider this, that in South Coast, the most polluted area in our country still. Um, today, more fine particles come from brake dust and tire wear in that air district than from heavy duty diesel trucks. That's right, brake dust and tire wear contribute more fine particles to the air than commercial heavy duty trucks. So that's how much cleaner diesels have gotten over the years. And when we turn the page to off-road engines, it's really the same story, but on a much more diverse scale. And you're familiar with the range of technologies that are powered by diesel from 20, 30 horsepower size engines and machines up to several thousand horsepower size machines. All of these have undergone the same kind of transformation to near zero emissions. And uh, now manufacturers are focused on making things more efficient. So they use less fuel, less CO2 emissions are generated. Includes things like the, the, the backup generator sitting outside one of the government buildings in Washington um, and the San Francisco fireboat, which is parked right out here at the dock. Um, all of those are powered by diesel technology. So let's finish up with a look about where diesel fits going forward in a low carbon, uh, sustainable future. 
Um, and I want to highlight four areas for you to, to help you understand the how and why uh, diesel is still a very important technology for the future. Um, and those of you that are in the, the fleet management uh, world, I, I, you recognize these simple things so, so readily. Um, we're doing things smarter now than we used to. And I'll give you a great example of this. You know, for so many years, contractors would roll down the road in those white panel vans with ladder racks on top. They got horrible mileage, and they often just carried air and the driver. They weren't really full of contents. Now what you've seen happen is that those vehicles are being increasingly replaced by smaller vehicles that are purpose-built. So you have better fuel economy, they're easier to park, safer in cities and urban environments where visibility is an issue. Um, we also see this evolving in other areas. S vehicle idle time is a great example. Nobody used to care about idle time, but it's given us tremendous fuel savings. It is really low-hanging fruit in terms of CO2 reduction. And it is now standard fare for features on new trucks, even off-road machines and equipment. Um, we used to just run an engine and, and belts and accessories off the engine. They ran all the time, no matter what the demand was. Now we're getting smarter. We're, we're starting to, in some applications, especially in the off-road space, operate the engine like a generator. So you find the sweet spot, the steady state, where it gets the optimum fuel efficiency, low emissions, and the performance you need, you know, 17, 1800 RPMs, whatever it is, and that's where you operate the engine. And instead of driving a mechanical powertrain, you're driving an electric motor. You're creating electricity through generator, and the electric motors are doing the work, applying the torque to the actual wheels. Uh, so this is, a, this is a, an area of great opportunity. And when I was thinking about this presentation, look at all these advancements in technology and emissions control. What hasn't changed a whole lot in the last 10 or 15 years? The fuel. This is the great opportunity for renewable diesel. And the last two slides here, I just want to highlight for you um, where diesel uh, fits going forward in the future. So think about engine efficiency um, and built on what's happening in the diesel. And we expect that the, the thermal efficiency in a diesel engine is going to continue to increase. Some of the projects in the super truck world um, by Volvo, by Cummins, by Navistar and others are showing uh, efficiency gains of over 50%. So that means that you're wasting half of the energy that you're creating to heat. Gasoline engines are high 20s, maybe 30% energy efficient. People are integrating systems a lot better. Transmissions and engines working together, designed together, optimized together. And this happens also in the off-road space. Case IH rolled out an autonomous tractor this year. You see there's no driver's seat at all. It's completely controlled by uh, uh, telematics and uh, satellites and other things. It's powered by a diesel engine, but it might provide great productivity gains in the farm sector. Um, and so increasing efficiency of the engine, again, foundation being the diesel engine, helps move us forward for more efficiency. The other areas where we see these gains are in hybridization and the integration with other sustainable energy resources. And so people often ask me, you know, when are we going to see a diesel, car, a diesel hybrid car? Well, Volvo had a diesel hybrid car in Europe for a number of years, and just the economics are, 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 are tricky because you've got two expensive powertrains there coming together. Great fuel economy, great performance, but we're probably not going to see it on the roads in the U.S. anytime soon. Not because the technology can't do it, but the economics really just aren't there to compete with other fuels and, uh, and priorities. Uh, but we do see it today in transit buses, wheel loaders, this is a great use for that. Um, but the point is that we're taking a diesel engine and we're making it better through the hybridization of how it does its work. Another great example is microgrids. The military has advanced the concept of trying to rely less and less on diesel power in the forward operating theaters around the world or just at military installations because of the high cost of transporting fuel, uh, the risk and all the other um, areas associated with that. Well, maybe we, should, we can back off the reliance on diesel fuel in power generation and instead integrate a diesel engine with a microgrid. So now you have a, a reliable diesel engine, you've got solar photovoltaic capturing most of the energy that you need, perhaps wind as well, all uh, coupled with battery storage. And I like to say that you know, it gives you the renewables that you want with the reliability that you need for these kind of settings. So you're completely unplugged from the grid, you're on your own with electricity. So that's a combination that's really unbeatable. 
And then the last area for great opportunity is the renewable diesel fuel. And I think one of the biggest advantages here is the suitability for all engines across all platforms immediately. Uh, you heard about the city of Oakland's experience, transformative overnight, low carbon footprint, no issues there. Um, I think this is the great, uh, the great opportunity for the future. And if we just look at the, the last few chapters of the diesel engine and we look forward into the future, we've been spending so much time working on getting emissions down to near zero levels. Now we're really starting to focus on efficiency and how can we reduce the fuel consumption of the engine, make it more efficient, and use uh, lower carbon fuels to lower the overall carbon footprint of the diesel. So that's where we're headed in the future. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that diesel engines are going to continue to be the number one uh, power source for those 15 sectors of the economy uh, in the future. And we now have this near zero emissions performance across the board. The biggest challenge we have really is getting more of the new technology out there. And California is kind of a unique case. Um, uh, California ranks 47th out of 50 states and the District of Columbia, so 51. It ranks 47 out of 51 for the penetration of the newest technology diesel engines on the road. Part of this is because California policies and their truck and bus rule, uh, but part of it is also due to economics and fleet turnover. So we can make huge advances going forward by simply getting more of the new clean trucks on the road. And then if you want to make that even better, use renewable diesel fuels in those vehicles. That's really a huge winning combination. So thank you very much, uh, folks at Neste, for uh, inviting me to be here, and I'll be happy to answer any questions later on. Well, thanks. Uh, I want to thank Neste for inviting Volvo to uh, uh, talk about their commitment to alternative fuels and, um, what, and explain to the, the group where Volvo is uh, globally in, um, in the pursuit of, um, of these new technologies. I'm an old Mac guy, so it's nice to hear Alan talk about diesel because I cut my teeth in diesel over 30 years ago. Um, but we realize there are other fuels out there that, uh, that we are interested in. I want to talk a little bit about the uh, portfolio of, uh, if you look at the Volvo Group business, you can see that we are very interested in the future of clean energy. We're a $42 billion company with 100,000 or more uh, employees in 119 countries and we manufacture in 18 countries. Trucks are the biggest part of our uh, business. Uh, it's about 65%, uh, and that includes Mack trucks, Volvo trucks, Renault trucks, UD, and um, some JVs in uh, India and China with um, Dongfang and Aisher. Construction equipment, another big part, important part of our segment with 20% uh, of our business being with VCE, Volvo Construction Equipment, and SDLG, a, uh, a JV in China. And then we also have a, um, a bus business, Prevo Coach. Can't call Prevo a bus, they would get upset. Uh, Nova City buses and, uh, and Volvo buses. And then we have uh, the Marine Vision uh, Penta, which also makes stationary vehicles. And to read through all of this is that they're Volvo engines. Uh, we're the biggest, close to the biggest, at least 13 liter uh, producer of diesel engines in, in the world. Environmental care. Uh, we have a long history of that. You can go back to 1972 when Volvo took a former position about environmental responsibility uh, long before it was uh, uh, popular to do so. Uh, at Volvo in 1985, we made the um, um, care for the environment, one of our core values. It's in the Volvo handbook. Everybody that, uh, that works at Volvo sees that on a year regular basis. Uh, we took these actions because we think that there's a strong belief in doing our part to protect the environment and ensure its health for future generations. And as an environmental steward, we are committed to exploring um, alternative technologies. Sustainable solutions model. Um, this is a kind of complicated slide, but it means three things to us. High pro productivity in the transportation system. That means the economics have to work for both us and the customer. 
The environmental um, dimension is, of course, very important. That's why we're here, to lower emissions, lower CO2. And then it also has to be safe and secure. We want to build products that are um, uh, secure transportation systems for people, for drivers, and for the, um, the goods that they are hauling. And then when you have these intersect, transportation solutions are fully sustainable um, and meet our Volvo Group vision for the future. But of course, there's no magic bullets. We all know that in this room. Long-term strategic plan, and um, we need to partner with the right people. We need to know where we're going as an industry. Today, we realize that dynamics change, but um, the, um, you know, it takes time to adapt to a different fuel. Uh, it's, there's a long, it's a long process. So the sooner we can find out where we're going as an industry, um, the better we'll be, and we need to start uh, as soon as possible. There are many options out there, and we're going to talk about a lot of them, and um, we're, as a company, are looking for solutions to our world's problems, and we're doing it a smart way so that we also can um, positively affect our business when we make those choices. You know, you got to think about feedstock, as it says, infrastructure, environmental impact, and policies and subsidies and mandates. So, um, almost 10 years ago to the day, um, Volvo bought, uh, brought seven alternative vehicles over to Western Maryland at the Hagerstown plant that, uh, um, where I belong, and uh, just test those vehicles and then take them to the Wyrick uh, International Conference in Washington, D.C. So we had these vehicles, we took them down to D.C., we put them in the convention center, uh, and we gave presentations uh, after the, um, the show at the Volvo uh, Embassy or Volvo offices in Georgetown, uh, talking about the pros and cons of all these vehicles. So you can see there's biodiesel, syn diesel, DME, methanol, ethanol, biogas, um, hydrogen biogas, and the combination dual fuel biogas and, uh, and biodiesel. Um, what wasn't on there at the time was the um, um, renewable deals that we're going to talk about today. So after evaluating all those fuels from 2007 um, through the last eight years, we've, um, we've identified four promising fuels. HVO, renewable diesel, was one of those. Uh, electricity, of course, that has been talked about here today. DME, uh, we still have a DME project. It's long term, it's not tomorrow uh, that we're working on. And then methane, gas, natural gas um, for uh, an LNG for maybe some long distance uh, transports if the infrastructure can be there. Some comments on the other ones that were left out is uh, biodiesel. Uh, we uh, have biodiesel approvals, of course. But there's technical issues with those. If you get into too high of blends, we're worried about contaminants that are in the biodiesel process that could um, interfere with the um, uh, degradation of our after-treatment. In other words, make it degradate uh, quicker. Uh, Syn diesel, uh, maybe another drop-in fuel, but the economics uh, don't seem to work very well. This is a kind of a busy side, but if you look at the top, that's fossil fuels. And this is a one to five scale. And for um, um, the, you can see where diesel is five. And if you look at the lower scale on biofuels, uh, bio is four and renewable diesel is also rated five. Um, and this is important for infrastructure and integration into, um, into this fuel system. So because of those two slides, or the three slides, where we identified renewable diesel as a, a good alternative, in the Hagerstown facility, we decided to do some testing fourth quarter of 2015. Uh, we used a 2015 software engine in a, uh, development, a 13-liter engine, 500 horsepower. And in this test cell testing, we wanted to measure emissions comparisons, of course, uh, how it impacted soot generation or regeneration that the uh, city of Oakland was talking about, uh, 
drop to Ida, which is a very important part for us. And the biggest impact that we were concerned about was onboard diagnostics, which came forward in 2014, because whether the fuel was changing uh, the emissions positively or negatively, we were worried that it might fool our very smart onboard diagnostic uh, system. We also added to that a, uh, a road test. We ran trucks out of Hagerstown uh, and a bunch of different driving cycles, uh, mixed driving where we were on interstate, coming on and out, a couple of the different city routes, and then what we call a dump route. Uh, and we were looking at uh, regeneration in those uh, lower three routes because that's where the temperatures don't get quite high enough for uh, uh, sometimes for good regeneration of the DPF. So, good news. In the uh, test cells testing, uh, engine out NOx was comparable to diesel, was basically NOx neutral. Soot generation considerably lower with renewable diesel, almost 50%. We measured that a couple of times. Uh, of course, we all know there's a little bit of difference in density, so at peak power, we've seen a difference between um, HVO and petroleum diesel. Park soot gener regeneration between the fuels looked almost identical. Temperatures achieved uh, were at the both, and there's nothing of concern there. Drop into idle, um, where we were concerned about the uh, max temperature getting too high, no concern, um, maybe a little bit lower than, uh, than diesel. And then the OBD impact that I, um, that I mentioned, we had no fuel-related faults in that testing. In the field test, we ran those cycles because in some of those um, uh, stop and go cycles, our seventh injector, which lights off regen uh, with biodiesel, sometimes we get some plugging, even with standard diesel at times. So with the uh, renewable diesel, we actually measured the flow through that injector before and during and after the, uh, the truck test and the flow never changed. It was 100% uh, in the beginning, 100% at the end, which was really good news for our um, uh, injection people. No faults on um, the cycles, no faults on, um, on anything that was fuel related. And back to the loss of power, the drivers didn't know what the fuel was, but they knew it was a test fuel. And um, we actually had some drivers who said it had more power, and it's just their perception that they were testing something better. So, based on all that testing, December of 2015, Volvo Truck approved use of renewable diesel for our engines, um, basically as a drop-in fuel. A month later, our sister company, Mac, uh, we did the same thing because basically uh, the testing was done on both and they're very, very similar. Again, another drop-in fuel. Both of these press releases are available on the Mac and Volvo website if you'd like to see them. So where do we go? Um, we still think that fossil and renewable diesel fuels will dominate the foreseeable future, which agrees to what uh, Alan said. Ethanol and propane, suitable for small engines that we don't make. Natural gas, biogas, um, you know, we're still looking at that, viable for some regional areas. Again, DME, it's a long-term project uh, for us. We are running some vehicles in North America, a uh, limited number of vehicles. And then the electric uh, vehicles for uh, short distance, plug-in, suitable, um, we certainly will support that.